Hi everybody, this is Jim Aiken. In this all too brief video, I'm going to show you a little bit about what it would be like to write interactive fiction using the TADS 3 authoring system. Uh, we're not going to talk in this video about what interactive fiction is. I'm going to assume that you already know that and that you're interested in writing your own game. We're also not going to talk about how to actually do programming in TADS 3 because, frankly, that would take terabytes of video data and you'd be staring at the screen for weeks. Printed documentation, which we will uh, look at in this video, is uh, a much better way to learn the programming language. Uh, the first thing you need to know is that there are a number of possible authoring systems for interactive fiction, and uh, TADS 3 is one of the most powerful but it does have one or two limitations. Uh, its principal limitation being that the authoring system, which you're looking at on your screen, which is called Workbench, is a Windows application. It's not cross-platform, and it's not browser-based. If we were to look at, uh, I'm going to open up my browser here, there are various other authoring systems that you might be interested in looking at, such as Quest, Inform7, Inkle Writer, and Twine. They're all good, and some of them are more limited than others. In order to work with TADS, you need to download it, and that means going to tads.org, clicking the download link, choosing an operating system, and clicking, I'd like to write my own game, and yes, I'd like to have the TADS 3 Authors Kit with full documentation, very good. When you do that, uh, you will be able to install the uh, Workbench application and you'll get all of the documentation to go with it. Now, if you're using a Macintosh, you can run Workbench in uh, a Windows emulator. I've done that and it's about 90, 99% functional. There may be one or two little teeny things that it won't do. The second thing you want to do when you're interested in working with uh, T3, as we call it, TADS3, is you want to decide whether you're going to use the standard uh, library, which was created by Mike Roberts, who created TADS, and that's called ADV3, or whether you want to use the newer ADV3 Lite library that was created by Eric Eve. <clears throat> and to be honest, I recommend ADV3 Lite for a couple of reasons. First is it's a little simpler than the full ADV3 library. And the second is that Eric has been very active in importing features that Inform7 programmers may be familiar with and may want to use. So it's really the, kind of the best of both worlds. You get the power of TADS and you get the uh, some of the user-friendly features of the Inform programming language. In order to download that, you would, well, you might want to go to the intfiction.org forum and search out uh, a topic in the, in the TADS development uh, area, which tells you what version is available. And then you would want to click on the download link and download that. You can also get a more recent version, possibly, that is not officially released from the GitHub repository. And all you have to do is go down here and click on the download link and you will get uh, the library in its most current incarnation which you can then install yourself. But where do you install it? Well to explain that we need to look at the Windows Explorer window. And what happens is that the TADS program itself is going to be down in program files but you are going to be working in my documents in a folder called TADS3. And this will have a subfolder. If it doesn't, you can create it called Extensions. And in Extensions, you can put ADV3 Lite. That will enable you to uh, get at those the, that other version of the library. Having done that, let's go back to Workbench. You also need to tell Workbench that you want to be able to use that. And that entails opening the Options window and telling it where your extensions are located and what library paths it should use. When you do all of that, you should be able to run TADS3 using ed 3 Lite here. Now the next thing uh, we're going to look at is how to use Workbench. How to use Workbench is, uh, this looks a little bit intimidating, but it's actually quite cool and quite powerful. First of all, 
when you're creating a TADS game, you will probably be using a number of different source files, each of which has source code for particular aspects of your uh, game. I have, for example, here, there's a source file for my main level and upper level and lower level of my map. And I have a whole file here of new verbs that I've created and a whole file full of portable objects that I've created. And all of these are running along the top here. And if I want to reorganize them, I can drag them around like this. And they're also listed here. So if I want to open one that's not listed, it's not currently available on the top, I just double click it here. And there it is, it's going to open up. The next thing that's kind of cool about Workbench is that down here, there are some scripts. Every time you run a test version of your game, Workbench will create a new script. And then you can right click on it and say replay, and that script will be replayed exactly as it was during your testing session so that you can uh, view any changes that have uh, happened in the output as a result of your new code that you've added. In the editor window, we have a couple of neat features here. We have code folding, which is if you click this, the objects will fold up and you won't be able to see them anymore. So you can see actually quite a lot of the source file in one window at one time. And if you want to look at, oh, let's see, here's a fixture called mannequins. I want to look at that. You just click on the plus icon and it opens up and I can see all of the code for mannequins. So the watch expressions window is something that, uh, well, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. So how do you build your game? Once you've created something, and let's go back over here to my original source file. At the very top, it needs to say these things here, which is all explained in the documentation. And then you write all of your code there. And when you're ready to go, you go up to the build menu and you select compile and run, or you can hit control F5, which is the uh, hotkey combination for that. And then your story window will pop up here. This happens to be a game that I'm working on called the only possible prom dress. And I'm not going to try to explain that. And when I'm working with it, I could say go south, go south again, or I can click up here and say, I'd like to go west this time. And now I'm in a different location. So um, TADS provides some very nice little uh, tools for people when they're actually playing the game. So that's one of the basic things you need to know. Another thing you probably want to know about is how the heck am I supposed to do all of this stuff? So let's look at the documentation. I have a, a shortcut on my desktop that opens up the Ed3 Lite Bookshelf, which is an HTML page that opens in my browser. And there is a lot of documentation here. There's a quick start guide, there's a tutorial, there's a learning book, there's, oh, three different manuals. And at the bottom, there's an introduction to HTML in case you want to use any of the enhanced features of uh, TADS to create a more uh, uh, clickable game. Now, when you're first starting out, you may want to look at the Learning Tads 3 document. This is a PDF book which opens up in your web browser. And you can scroll down and look at the table of contents. And I would seriously recommend reading this book um, because it will tell you all kinds of useful stuff. What people don't necessarily know about the manuals at first, though, is that there's no overall index here. So it's a little tough to tell what's what and where you want to find it. So you should at least browse the tables of contents of the library manual, which has more detailed uh, or explicit information about things like how to create keys and topics and beginnings and endings. Um, but the most cool thing about this in the not the easiest to understand is the library reference manual. When I first started learning TADS 3, I thought, what the heck is this thing? I didn't understand it at all. But really, this is one of the most useful tools. There's a window down here. This is the browse window for the uh, reference manual. And all of the classes that are defined by the library are listed here. So if I want to know about the door class, I click on there. And here is some information on the door and how it is implemented. There's all kinds of stuff down here that I could click on. 
or I could, if I want to see the actual source code, I can click on Travel T line 560, and here is the code definition of the door class. So this is all very useful stuff. You can scan through here and see, oh yeah, okay, the door class by default, the is openable property is true. And if I don't want to look at classes over here, I could look at all symbols and I could say, okay, let's look in the C. I want to see what can catch thrown method is. And that takes me to this page where I can now click through here and see the actual code. By default, this method just says return true, but there could be other situations that you might want to override that with your own code. Now we're just going to look at one little tiny bit of Tad's programming, and then we're going to call it a day. Let's go back to my source code. You'll notice that there are indents here, and the Workbench editor automatically does an indent. So if I have something that's a little more complicated, let's see if I can find something more complicated here. Oh, that's another thing you might want to know. If I don't want to use this bit of code right now, there's a button up here that comments or uncomments it. When it has two slash marks at the beginning and it's in green, it's commented out and it won't do anything. But if I do that, now it's active. Well, I'm going to get rid of that. But when I create code, here we go. Here's something that has indents. Everything is going to be in bracketed blocks. You can see the, the direct object for the knock on verb has a block that goes from here to here and the curly braces are highlighted, which is very useful because that will tell you if you've properly closed the curly braces. If I click on this, you see that? That curly brace is now green. And if I type here, it's going to automatically indent further. You see where the cursor went right to there? It knows that I'm inside of this block and so all of that is going to be indented that much. So that's one little tiny bit of what coding is like. And that's about all we have time for. But uh, if you have the patience to get into this, I think you'll be amazed.